Um, and so that's kind of like, I've done a few slides at the start of this presentation and, and kind of renamed it a little bit, like blockchain. We're 10 years into this technology. So it's kind of like, you know, I've sort of seen it from the start. Um, I wrote that a little bit about me about two years ago. So that, I've actually been teaching it and actively running the Brisbane Ethereum meetups for four years now. Um, and so just seeing all the patterns that people have been going through and people get into the investing and they want to make money, they compare it to fiat currency. You can't really compare it to anything, basically. It's like, you've got to make it mean something, this technology, and uh, I'm going to talk about how we can anchor it to things that we really value, like our land. So I have a property up in the Sunshine Coast, so I'm going to run through an example of uh, tokenizing properties and how you can make it practical now. Um, and then I'm also going to be talking about tokenizing businesses. Uh, so, but first, we'll just do this first section and talk about, you know, the history of blockchain. Um, and, you know, that we're on our 10th year now and uh, where, where the blockages are. So, shall I continue? All right, cool. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, uh, who understands blockchain? Just who really understands it, you feel like you get it. All right, I've got a little, um, g'day Dan, got a little uh, animation that will sort of like help people understand it from a non-technical perspective. Um, and I feel like this is a really important animation to show people these days, uh, just because it does mean different things to different people, but uh, just like the internet means different things to different people. Um, but this is um, one of the biggest reasons why blockchain technology was created. So I'll run through that animation as well. So where are we at? So 2008, the, the calculator was created, the Bitcoin calculator. Um, and we all know about that now. Everyone says, go and read the white paper. Uh, and yeah, that's, that sort of opened up our minds about um, and got us to re-question uh, what money systems really are and made this question a mainstream question. Um, and so Bitcoin had a very anarchist sort of feel to it. Uh, you know, it was all about attacking the banks. I don't really see the, the point in that because we're just going to create lots of um, arguments and misconceptions and people getting angry about different things, that different special interest, interest groups have different reasons. That's why, you know, People get banned from banks. In fact, I've been banned from two banks dealing with Bitcoin over the last 10 years. Can't make an account with them. So that's when uh, people started. Uh, I've been banned from Bank of Queensland, um, and I've been banned from uh, Heritage Bank uh, just for doing a Bitcoin transaction. Uh, I think this sort of information needs to be public. Uh, yeah, and they just, they, all they say is they send you a letter and they say you've got six weeks to get your money out, um, otherwise you won't have your money either. That's how, that's how it works. Um, and then 2000, so 2014, Ethereum started bringing about this conversation about inclusive financial, financial inclusivity. Um, and it was because so many people have been banned from banks and also because uh, large companies, you know, who run banking systems right now, they don't care about providing banking services to people who turn over a dollar a day. So Ethereum started really pushing that message out there, and, and blockchain in general started pushing that message out there. Um, and uh, so, and you can start thinking of Ethereum as a general purpose smart contracting platform, or a giant decentralized computer. Um, that's the best way. What holds most projects back is reliable decentralized solution to verifying a person is who they are and not some imposter or some hacker. So that's one, that's one big reason. So then everyone started getting really big in 2014 about identity. Oh, identity is broken. We need to solve identity. Um, and Ethereum really brought that conversation. Um, I'm, not, I'm not for Ethereum. I'm not for Bitcoin. I don't really care about any of those conversations. I'm for social justice um, and transparency of the black boxes that run our lives these days. Does that make sense? All right, cool. I just think, you know, you, got, you would need to know what I stand for. And one of the first things when I talk to you guys is I really do want to know what you stand for. Otherwise, everything else is small talk and kind of like waste of time. So if we adhere to security best uh, practices, you can manage um, an account and make it unhackable. Um, but some would say it's not consumer friendly. So there was this big drive for hardware wallets. Um, and uh, that's why we've got Treasure, Trezor and Nano and all these other ways, offline and cold storage, all these conversations started popping up. That, that was happening before Ethereum, by the way, so that was in the Bitcoin space. Um, and, 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 that's, and if you go and, go and speak to a, an engineer or computer scientist um, about the most secure way uh, to manage your identity or manage your, interfa your, you know, your connection to a blockchain, um, and then you go and hand, you know, there's about probably about 50 companies around the world, big cashed up companies building identity systems on top of Ethereum and other blockchains right now. 
Um, and they'll say well, they'll never trust any of them because you know, there's, there's still a middleman in there. Um, you know, either trusting Apple with your private key or you're trusting Google with your private key. You're trusting you know, the hardware inside there that might have a back door. We don't know. These are, again, the black boxes that we're dealing with. So they won't trust um, these identity systems that are going to start coming out on top of you know, Ethereum and these other blockchains. They'll say that the best way to manage your identity is to not send anything over the wire and manage your private keys. And that kind of makes sense. Like, if you're going to like, unlock your car, you don't really give your car keys, your private keys, to other people. So you've got to just sort of start becoming responsible for your keys to the blockchain world. That's, that's the way I see it. Whoops. And we'll come back to that animation. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't matter what type of identity system uh, that we start using in the future. I personally am not going to trust it because it's still going to be coded by some programs that I don't trust. Um, and there's, they, they, they do what is, in Ethereum, what we're doing is uh, proxy contracts. Um, and, and proxy contracts is where you can sort of like put your real identity behind it, but then you have this proxy contract that sort of interfaces with the rest of the world so that you can, uh, basically you can scrap that proxy contract and create a new one for every single dApp that you sort of interact with. Um, and, you know, like this is all very new code. I don't trust it. I've played around with this code myself. And you know there is room for hacking at the moment. So I think another 10 years, and then maybe those proxy contracts will be safe. That's my uh, sort of thing. Whoop. And then there's another thing. You know that uh, people who currently manage people's identity uh, will say that they just they don't really have enough faith in humanity that we're going to solve these problems ourselves. And they, so if you have companies like Microsoft saying. Uh, we'll manage people's private keys. Um, and, and so Michael, Microsoft has created this uh, uh, private key vault uh, that you know, a lot of enterprise solutions are starting to use. Um, I was over in the Philippines, and that ended up being the, the one, number one way. You know, it's just a matter of time before they get hacked, because they're just such a big target. You know, you imagine you've got a server with people's private keys, and it's holding all their money, and it's holding their property, everything. It's just a matter of time before someone gets socially engineered and hacked. So, um, so they, but their argument is that they don't, they don't trust other humans, just like I don't trust other humans, um, just like most people don't trust other humans, and so they would rather manage people's bank accounts themselves, and so you've got com companies like Commonwealth Bank trying to manage everyone's identity in Australia, um, and it won't work, it's just going to fail. Um, so people freak out about scaling issues, so these are the other reasons why we're at this stage. Uh, everyone's consumed by this conversation about scaling. We haven't even maxed out Ethereum or any of these blockchains yet. So I would rather just max them out right now and then have that conversation because at least it proves that it works. Um, and, and, and people can see what happens when something gets, when a computer gets chonked up. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Just like when you're using your 486 or your, your old slow computer right now, it just stops responding. That's all that happens uh, when Ethereum chonks up. It just stops responding. Um, and then all the traffic dies down. And then, you know, the, when I'm talking about traffic, I'm talking about transactions. Um, and then, but it, it obviously gives us a lot of thinking space to think about, well, okay, well, it's not working right now. What do we do? It'll, all, it'll, it'll catch up again. Um, but anyway, so I don't see that as a big issue at all because um, then lots of other blockchains got, started coming out and talking about, oh, we'll scale you know, this way you know, through randomness. So a, a, a really cool blockchain that I really love is called Definity. Um, and it's basically a proof of randomness. So it's where like, uh, it will randomly go and choose of the you know, million computers on that network that are verifying transactions. It will randomly go and choose 400 computers to go and be the verifier of all these next, this next block of transactions. Um, and you can, if you start using these types of um, uh, algorithms um, or functions, uh, you can really scale Ethereum up. Because at the moment, what Ethereum was doing was it was just focusing on uh, massive security and not focusing on scalability at the moment. It didn't, we didn't care about that because no one believed in the technology back then. Um, and so um, it's very interesting because Ethereum have just changed their roadmap uh, uh, about a week ago um, to actually uh, start using proof of randomness and proof of stake um, in the upgrades. So that wasn't the solution, but you know, basically a, a project called Affinity built on the Ethereum, uh, or money raised by the Ethereum platform. Um, there, some cryptographers said, oh, okay, why don't we just use the ideas of Affinity 
um, and, and, start, and start applying that to Ethereum. And so that's what's going on. And I picked this up two years ago, uh, and it's now just been announced. Um, so the, the co what, what I'm saying is that, yeah, scalability has been solved. I mean, I have issues with using this randomness, these randomness uh, functions. It's kind of like, it's actually very hard to do random things on a computer because everything's so systemized and so methodic. Um, but apparently, I'm, I'm not a good cryptographer or anything, I've got no idea about it, but you know, cryptography is, you can use some functions in cryptography that can create completely random value, values um, and you can't mimic that anywhere else. So as long as that's safe, apparently from cryptographers, even from Br in Brisbane here that are, who are writing the functions, it's quite amazing we have such roots into this, in this technology right here in Brisbane, we don't even know it. Um, so the actual cryptographers who are writing these functions right now for Ethereum, um, they say through mathematical proofs that yeah, you can have complete randomness and then this can, you can use this complete randomness to go and choose 400 computers by random um, and then those 400 computers can be the verifiers of the next block. Because you think about it, you don't really need Ethereum or every computer on the Ethereum network or any blockchain to verify every single transaction. You just need about 400, you know? You don't need heaps. Um, and then, so, um, so that's what's going on and so that's what a lot of blockchains are doing now. Um, you had EOFs, they got basically seven nodes that are verifying everything. So uh, they call them data centers. So they're very vague about their terms. Um, but you know, to go and compromise the security or the integrity of those transactions, you would have to just go and knock on the door of each of those data centers and say, look, these values here, this bank account, we just want these numbers changed to this. So there's huge scope for man in the middle attacks when you start doing, uh, when you start scaling it down to just 12 data centers or 12 computers or whatever they may be. Um, but I, I see a lot of hope in um, yeah, this randomness and, and using cryptograph cryptographic functions to, to go and choose uh, what the, who those computers will be and not leaving it up to a, a middleman. Um, but yeah, the cool thing is since two th in 2008 now we have um, plenty of proof of concepts. You know, everyone's talking about proof of concepts. I'm sick to death of proof of concepts. So. Um, you know, I'm trying to get real practical, um, so I've been, I'm running uh, weekly Ethereum dev hacks now. Not just Ethereum, but DAP hacks, um, where we can start teaching up and training more programmers to do things. Um, so, does that make sense, guys? That, that's kind of my summary of it, my view of it all. Um, you know, I wanted this to go mainstream six years ago, uh, and it's really taken a long time. Um, I'm just going to give a, a blockchain from a non-technical sp perspective, and this was sort of the, one of the original reasons why Ethereum was created. Um, Bitcoin was created just to sort of like uh, displace the banks, and that was a good narrative at the time. Uh, it got a lot of people together to start thinking about this, how we can use these more secure databases. Um, but there was a bigger narrative, um, and uh, I think Jeremy Rifkin sums it up quite nicely. He's also the, um, uh, he's the, he's the guy who wrote the third industrial revolution just came out in February, I think. He did a Vice documentary uh, in February as well um, about uh, uh, the third industrial revolution and what it really is. He's also the advisor to the um, president of China and also uh, European Commission um, about this transition to the third industrial revolution. And when you start reading his book and, uh, and understanding his ideas and where he's coming from, he's basically talking that we have nation states that you know, have people have their identity um, link their identity or their community to their country um, and that's how they see themselves um, and obviously that type of identity or that type of system we're not going to solve things like global warming because we can't all come together and reach consensus you know you've seen how lots of different um, agreements to lower carbon emissions from governments keep failing and so Ethereum was created to try and reach consensus in some way and solve these issues so you know, governments don't want to work on each other's database. You know, we've got government departments that don't trust each other. Um, you know, just this trust issue just keeps coming up left, right, and centre. So Ethereum was like, well, how can we create a database that everyone that's totally inclusive, um, that you know doesn't lock anybody else, el el anybody else out? Um, and that was Ethereum. Um, and and so um, it's basically the, the challenge is, you know, we've got seven billion people on the planet. Um, how can we reach ongoing cons consensus in every single moment with 7 billion people on the planet where everyone would be happy? One of the first things is we're not going to make these decisions on some one person's server. So Ethereum was created. And, um, but basically, it's just a place to record events or, or record logic. 
Um, and so Bob and Jane, they sign a legal contract. That could be anything. Uh, what's your name, sir? Ted. Ted. If I hand Ted $5. In fact, how about we use a different currency? How about I hand Ted five apples? Okay? And Ted turns around and says, I didn't get those five apples. Well, the thing is, everybody is recording this event right now. Blockchain is the way our brains work right now. Um, and, uh, and it's basically peer-to-peer -peer witness. So everyone is, this is a, witness, this is a contract um, where it's witnessed by everyone else. So I hand Tay five, five apples and Tay says I didn't get my apples. Well, hang on, we've all shared the story amongst each other. We've all recorded it with our brain and Chinese whispers, hopefully not, uh, recorded uh, this event. Um, and as long as the Chinese whispers don't get too much out of control, uh, if Ted turns around and says, where's my apples? I can then turn to you and say, well, hang on, Ted did do this, get, get his apples, and if you guys are in agreement, then enforcement happens by default. So that's the mechanism that we're trying to do with blockchain. Um, you know, engineers and computer scientists are struggling to explain that mechanism to people, but that's what we're trying to do uh, in a nutshell. Now, the, the crazy thing is that we can't expect our brains to remember every single event um, you know, that's ever happened in history. Um, and so, you know, like just simple bananas or uh, five lollies or whatever it might be, or five dollars, it's just another thing. Um, so we're, we're, we've got all this uh, amazing computational power now sitting in our box pockets. And so we can start using computers to remember these events. Um, and that's the only difference is that, you know, computers are the medium, so that might be our smart devices. Uh, and that's, that's how it all works. That's, that's, that's how we can start coming to agreement, ongoing consensus about lots of different things. So the idea is that the sum of all those agreements, or we could put some logic in there as well, some what we call uh, crypto law, um, which was brought about by Ethereum, uh, specifically Gavin Wood, one of the founders of Ethereum. Um, and, and the idea was that, well, we can use this crypto law to start managing lots of small decisions which will then feed up to bigger decisions or bigger agreements that we've had. Um, and we might start implementing contracts that start managing carbon emissions and things like that. And this is in a way that once we implement this, it can't just be the next politician comes in and, and knocks, knocks all that hard work for the last four years out and uh, we're back to square one again. We're all talking. Um, and the cool thing is that all of this is open source by default. Uh, so any contract you put up there, anybody can see. Um, so there's no, there's no, there's, if you don't trust the contract, then go and look at the contract yourself. Um, and if, if you think there's a better one, or you think you can write a better one, you can go and write it. And then, you know, if people think that's working for them, then they'll start gravitating to use those contract architectures as well. Does that make sense, guys? Is that a good explanation of Ethereum or, or blockchain in general? That's how it works. Um, so this is how we can start, you know, basically having computer-aided consensus with seven billion people on the planet. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're starting to do, there's this concept of wet tokens and dry tokens. Have you heard of this before? So wet tokens are basically tokens that uh, have a loose meaning, basically, and up to uh, a lot of interpretation about what those tokens might mean. And then there's dry tokens, like say for instance, you might write a smart contract that every time a computer goes through you know, a billion cycles that one token gets created. Now there's no, no discrepancy about a billion cycles. We have a ticker on a machine and we, can, we know that, that when that token, when, it, when a billion cycles ticks over on that machine, one token gets put into an ecosystem or minted on a smart contract, whatever that. Um, whatever that, so, so a dry token is basically something that you can't really argue with. You know the machine did a billion cycles and then one token got created. Wet token is something that, you know, we're still, it starts, I see it's a bit more sort of up to um, interpretation. And um, so, um, so what's going on over the next 10 years is I see that we're going to start turning more and more of these uh, wet tokens into drier tokens or back them up by drier tokens. Um, so people might go and buy into some token ecosystem or buy some token and they may have read the white paper and saw that the token means something um, but then when the developers go and do something they realise that actually what the person bought that token for and what the developers are doing with that token are completely different things. So we're going to have to start getting more clarity on what tokens actually mean 
Um, and that's just going to be up for like total experimentation, really. Like we just got to go through it. Oftentimes, you just got to go through it before we can start really having a conversation about what we want to make these tokens really mean. And generally, what we're going to start doing is just tying these tokens more and more to dry things, so that there's no discrepancy and backing it up. Uh, and that's what Ethereum did. So eventually. What I see is going to happen is we're just going to, as we start solving these larger issues of global warming, we're going to tie these tokens to nature, um, where there's things that just can't be um, uh, interpreted in, other, in any different ways. I don't know what all those conversations are going to look like, but they're going to sound crazy if we start having those conversations right now. But that's what's going to happen. It's just going to follow through. Because that's really the only ecosystem that we're bound by. That's the only limitation. We've got this... Uh, you know, thin layer of oxygen that we can all breathe, and we've got to manage it. Um, so that, you can tell, global warming drives me. Uh, and that's going to basically result in things like this. We're going to have a closer relationship to our hospitals or core services. Um, as, you know, I've spoken to lots of local governments around the world. They're all stuffed. None of them have good funding anymore on these, you know, fiat currency systems um, on the national level. So, you know, Logan government was one of the first governments in Australia to say, look, we're stuffed. Uh, we need to start doing things differently. And so now they're, they're open to new conversations. Western Australian governments are open to new conversations. So anyone who's ba any small governments who are being financially excluded from the federal budget are going to start taking these token ecosystems seriously and creating new trading tools. One of the coolest things about local governments is they don't realise how much value they hold. So once they start tokenising their services, and by the fact, when they tokenize their services on the public chain, they also start becoming transparent in all their finances. So that's really cool as well. So it's cool because we don't need to have, you know, trust one or two or three accountant auditors in, in a government anymore or for a not-for-profit. Uh, we're all equipped with the tools and the information to go and audit um, any of these transactions. And we're, it's just as simple as writing a comment on one of these transactions and, and putting it up in social media and... And, 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 show, and, and saying, look, you know, this is a little bit suspicious. I thought this government was going to do something good. Uh, and they're doing something different to what the, the story that they're putting out there is. So it's cool. So get used to everyone being an auditor um, and that you're going to see that more and more. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but it's, at some point people are going to start putting transactions into Facebook and, 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 and sharing all their comments and then, you know, it's going to blow up and people are going to get, you know, really fired up about something. So that's exciting. But basically, I'll share a, uh, an example of um, what we're doing here. We're just tokenizing business services. So a hospital, who prov something that provides a lot of value. Um, uh, you know, everything, you know, imagine if your local hospital was managed by um, some type of token ecosystem or managed by transparent finances. One of the biggest things with hospitals is their finances are going, their, 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 their um, yearly budgets are going down, okay, and the waiting lists. Um, uh, are just getting longer and longer, and you know, everyone's just turning a blind eye to it. But you know, I think hospitals are going to be one of the first tipping points. That some hospitals in poorer areas are just going to say, "Look, we don't have enough money." And the cool thing is that crowdfunding is mainstream now, so it's just a matter of them pushing out, launching a token pool, and then people who have got sick people in that hospital will do anything to make sure that hospital is funded. Um, and once people get a taste of that transparency, it's going to be very exciting. Um, because you know hospitals will get will really start to rally communities. Same with like where I live, uh, rural fire brigades. You know we're, we're worried about fires all the time. Um, you know what, what's amazing with fires is that in this year in Australia, um, fire brigades around Australia have to fight um, uh, a lot more hotter fires with 20% less budget, and that's just been happening year after year. So how we're going to have to get smart with how we actually fight fires. Um, so this is, people are starting to understand these uh, sort of token ecosystems um, in, in some sort of way, sustainable token, token ecosystems. And that's how on, you know, businesses will be able to, if they're doing good, will be able to be supported ongoing despite any type of you know, uh, government funding or um, funding that could be at risk of being pulled by a third party at any point in time, which kills so many projects. You don't need to do that anymore. So what can we do now? Well, I love that we're getting sponsored here by Trezor. Um, I'm a big fan of Trezor. Uh, we can basically uh, really get blockchain sa savvy. Um, people say, you know, you speak to people at Microsoft and they say, oh, no, but we can't trust people with their private keys. Well, there once was a time when you couldn't trust people with phones. People learned how to dial on a telephone. Um, and, you know, we're just going to go through this learning curve. Um, uh, and, and the other thing is about uh, 
you know, there once was a time when people didn't understand the internet or a telephone or a car or whatever it might be. So there will come a time when the majority of us will know how to interact with blockchain technology in, in a really secure way. Um, and it won't be through one of these identity systems. Um, so we might as well all upgrade our skills and learn how to do this, I think. So how can we start using the blockchain capabilities? Well, we need to start basically managing our private keys. Um, throw away identities. So the cool thing about running, uh, managing your own identity or your own interaction with blockchains uh, and you do it yourself is that you know, if you stuff up your identity, you can throw it away. And it's the same with an email address right now. Um, I would hate that you, once you get an identity system and you've been given it by a government or you know, Commonwealth Bank, I would hate that that's the only identity you could ever have. You know, people make mistakes in life. Um, I think it's important that people can throw away their identity. My name's Tom right now. I was born as Tom. But maybe I don't like Tom and I might want to throw that name out and choose to call myself Sam. Okay? I have that right, and you should have that right with blockchain as well. Um, if we start locking people in, into identities, uh, we're basically creating a mental prison for ourselves. So this, this technology can go in two different ways. We could basically imprison the whole world or we could um, give complete free and abundance. So I think we're going to go for the later. Um, so what are private keys? Well, if you don't get this, it took me a long time to get it. Okay, I didn't know cryptography or any of this uh, stuff when I was learning, but it did take me a while. So you've got public keys and private keys. Um, and this was the best sort of analogy that I could realise. So basically, with blockchains, you, you, you use a, cryptogra a cryptographic function to create a, um, or, or create a private key. And then from your private key, you can actually create your public keys. Now, your private keys are the ones that allow you to move money, um, but your public keys are the ones that allow you to see anyone's accounts. That's all it is. Um, and, and and so obviously that makes sense that you, know, you, you want to keep your private keys safe and that's why they, they label the word private onto it. Um, and your public keys, well, if you're going to go and share an account, I'm just talking in Ethereum in general now, um, you, know, you, want, you want to tell them where to send it. Like, it's like a letterbox. So you want to tell people where to send, that, where to send tokens to you. Um, and that's how it works. So with a private key, you could withdraw tokens from that account. With a public key, you can just view. So that's a good way to think about it. Um, now, basically, once you've got the foundations of blockchain security out of the way and you know, that, you know how that works um, and you're not at risk of phishing or social hacking, um, then, then, then you can start really experimenting. Um, and so we can start then playing around with uh, basic smart contract execution. And that means token transfers, uh, simple product purchases via tokens, um, and uh, simple tokenization of assets. Now, I'll give an ex uh, yeah, probably could give an example. Now what I see happening ne next is and then we're creating basically an environment where we can all experiment with governance, okay? And programmers don't have all the solutions. We're just, we can follow through on, you know, what people want next. Um, and that's what I'm really interested in. Like, once we get that basic security out of the way, we can start thinking about, well, what, how do you want to use this technology next? Um, and this is where I like to say that we're just in the age of rapid or crazy experimental governance. That's what's going on on the planet right now. Um, and then once we start going through this experiment, experimentation stage, which we're all really about to go through now, then we're going to start realising that there's some contracts that work really well for people um, and they resonate a lot with people um, and then they will become more sort of standard and mainstream at that point. So that's what I see going on now. What is tokenization? Well, this is my um, definition. There's no real definition of it. You know, you'll get some authoritative figure saying tokenization is this. But it doesn't really matter because everybody has the same power these days, okay? A 12-year-old programmer in India can release some smart contracts that completely transform Australia. If you really think about it, that's what's going on. Um, you know, it might be, I said like two years ago, it might be that China released welfare systems for the whole world. Do we really want them to be releasing it? Like, shouldn't we jump up and start doing stuff as well? So there's going to be the explosion of welfare systems. I mean, even at Consensus, we've got a huge team of people talking backwards and forwards about what universal basic income looks like. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's just a very one view of what universal basic income looks like. What would you guys think? It might be that you know, we have lots of conversations and make some decisions about the world um, that prove to be completely wrong because you know, people live differently here and universal basic income means something completely different here. 
So we're really ha are sort of lifting up the curtains on everything and rethinking about what the meaning of life is, I think, if you want to get really broad. But yeah, tokenization is the act of using blockchain to create a dis digital representation of a physical idea or thing. Um, that's pretty much it, as broad as it is. Um, and uh, if there's something that is greater than one person, maybe tokenization is, is a good tool to use. Um, you know, I'm talking about uh, with global warming. Like, it's just just doesn't seem we haven't been able to come to an agreement on how we're going to manage, uh, you know, the biosphere. Um, maybe tokenization is a way that we can start doing that and getting the sum of all these decisions on the tokens we transfer around <coughs> to start uh, adhering to a, a, a larger agreement that we all have. Because that's what money is as well. It's just an agreement. We just decided this fiat currency has some type of value, value, and yeah, we just got people obsessed with it. So there's some tokens. Uh, this is just really early day tokens. Look, I took a screenshot on a good day. Yeah. Anyway, that, that is such an emotional roller coaster. Just don't buy into the conversation. It's, it's an old traditional mindset, you know, trying to apply um, ideas to something totally new that's never been around before. This is not about investing. It's still nothing to do with investing. Okay? Uh, so we'll talk about um, uh, tokenization of property just because it's something that people. Um, Understand. So generally, uh, with property, you know, a property transfer, you, you would go and submit a form to the title deeds office and they keep a database, a record on who owns what. Now we've got a really good, um, you know, trustworthy uh, title of deeds office in Australia. Um, so we don't really have this issue, but um, I wrote a lot of the, the content that <coughs> delivered uh, the uh, blockchain to the World Bank and it became really clear to me that most people don't have um, some type of sort of record of who owns what in other countries. Um, and so that's one of the, 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 the big problems that the World Bank's trying to solve. I think it's a great idea. Um, just to give you an example, uh, when people were being displaced in uh, Assad, what, what, what is it? Saudi, not, it's not Saudi, what? Assad, Syria. Um, people were actually recording, um, and it's going on right now, uh, recording their, you know, their papers and stuff onto the Ethereum blockchain to prove that once they get back there, to prove that they do own this property. Um, I watched a really good Four Corners documentary about you know, why all the wars are kicking off. It's all down to uh, global warming. It's down to you know, people not having safe, you know, consistent rain, farming environments to... So they're all being displaced. They, don't, they can't farm there. They don't know what's going to happen next. So there's a lot of unstability. So it comes down to managing uh, our weather patterns. So I know I'm giving you a really broad conversation, but this is, this is what we're dealing with, guys. Um, so it became really clear to me that we do need to use this technology to manage who owns what. Um, and so then you deal with navigate, you know, first world countries and the uh, massive amount of, you know, regulations that we break every day. Um, and, uh, and, well, how would we use it here? So, well, this is what we're doing on our property. Uh, we've got a property in the Sunshine Coast, 12 acres. So we've basically bought the property through a registered business. Um, and then that registered business, uh, you know, has a lot of sub-agreements. So what we've got here, you know, just as all businesses do, they have lots of sub-agreements, but you don't report every single agreement uh, to the ASIC or, you know, to the title of the deeds office. Um, and so one of the big things is that, oh, okay, if you're going to start tokenizing property, how do you pay capital gains tax? Well, according to the um, title of the deeds office, the businesses, I mean, the property is always owned by the business. Um, and I've been in meetings with... Uh, some of the largest property value companies in the world and, so, and the largest banks in the world. And uh, they've been very um, sort of like standoffish about this technology, saying it's never going to work. And then by the end of the meeting, this has happened multiple times, by the end of the meeting they're just like, oh wow, okay, what do we do next? Because um, they can see that this is going to happen. Um, so, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say here in this, uh, in this point is that this is, this, this, this is a mainstream way of how properties will be tokenized and a nice legal way of doing it as well. So capital gains tax is, um, you can do all sorts of things. So the next thing is that people might say, well, hang on, hang on, if these token are the token holders, then they need to pay capital gains tax on every single transaction. <laughs> you can get around that as well. I'm, I'm so annoyed that we have to do legal loopholes with everything, but um, you can just say, look, these, these tokens represent 99-year lease or something like that, and that you know, the, land the landholder can never, you know, in that lease agreement, can never you know, give you three months notice and, and force you off that land. This is, this is a, so you can make it as similar to ownership as possible, but uh, 
but it's just a lease, uh, so that you can get around that as well. Um, so basically, all you're going to have is just a legal agreement, uh, and that could just be a meeting minutes that everyone signs, that says, okay, this property is owned by the tokens, uh, oh, sorry, by the account holders that manage this. Now these account holders could be uh, people, they could be other contracts, uh, they could just be some type of entity, it could be a tree. Um, you know, I'm, do I'm doing projects where we're starting to tokenize trees. Um, it could be anything, it could be another property that has some logic built into it. So, yeah, so it, it becomes really clear that the current regulations that were probably written 20 years ago uh, are not ap appropriate, um, applicable to these new environments that we live in. Um, and then you can basically put this on the public chain. Uh, and this is auditable by anybody, so what I, what I like about it is it minimizes a lot of uh, uh, corruption um, and you don't have to trust an auditor. Because we've all seen um, charities where you've got to trust the auditor and then it ends up being uh, just as corrupt or even more corrupt than you ever thought possible. So that's standard behavior at the moment. So you can comment on any transaction to say if it's fair or suspicious. Um, that's what I like to equip everyone with. So here's an example. Um, feel free to take a photo of this or whatever. Like this is all you need to do. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> not an accountant. Um, spent enough time to talk with them and stuff to realize that, you know, they're out of their league on this one as well. So we're in new territory. It's experimental, extremely experimental. Um, but you know, some of these arguments are good. Uh, so that would be one way. Uh, so. Um, and we haven't implemented this officially yet. I just want to point that out. This is just experimental, but this is the way we're going at the moment. Uh, so LifeBubble Trust solely managed by LifeBubble's PTY, property and assets, um, blah, blah, blah. You reference a contract. People can go in through and look at that. If the property were sold, the proceeds of the sale would be proportionally disputed to the token holder entities. Um, you know, it's great to see a legal contract that's not so complicated. Um, you know, and a bunch of, it, it, we can simplify things now, like that, that's what's cool. The token holder entity reserves the right to hold a copy of this legal agreement uh, so that this offer, basically offers protection in case LifeBubble P2Y did not follow through on their agreement. So say for instance the property was sold at the, um, you know, after tax and all that is paid, uh, the rest of it would be split up by, you know, fractionally owned of the, of the holders. Uh, and then you've got this other, other question about, you know, if you're going to launch one of these token systems, like uh, a lot of the, um, I've been in a lot of some programming groups where we're actually not allowing the contract owners of, of smart contracts to mint more tokens because there's no governance rules about when tokens should be, more tokens should be minted. But a lot of the, you know, you speak to someone like Reserve Bank of Australia or, you know, reserve banks around the world, they always reserve the right to mint more tokens. That's why we're in the mess that we are. That's why everything gets more expensive because we keep flooding the market with more tokens, Australian dollars. Um, and, but there's a good use for that as well. Like, you know, certain things, once you run out of finances, you might need to mint more tokens. But you need to ask for, you need to ask for permission by the token holders. So they should be, they should be if they're going to hold their energy um, or their representational energy into a, um, an energy pool, a token ecosystem, um, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know there's 120,000 tokens, but then you turn around and now there's 240 tokens, 240,000 tokens, you'd be pretty angry because the value of your tokens just dropped by half because there's more tokens on the market. So there should be some type of, if, uh, some type of governance process or physical signing process or a, a multi-sig wallet process where the token holders or maybe you could implement some smart contracts, uh, some logic that people, accounts that are holding over 4,000 tokens, uh, are also um, privy to the idea that they can actually, uh, if, if, if the contract owner wants to create more tokens, um, that they have to get a, a, a signature, a digital signature or a, a physical signature um, for that permission. So that's what we're doing in here. New life bubble tokens can be minted after assigned meeting, meeting minutes of all token holders are holding over 3,000 tokens stating the reason for minting more tokens. So we might want to mint more and sell them on the market. Uh, it might be to pay for new water tanks on the property that we're all obviously invested in um, and obviously want more water storage. Um, minting tokens will be an agenda item for discussion approximately every quarter or is deemed necessary by the LifeBubbles P2I LCD. 
So that's, that's uh, one way that you could go about tackling it. I'm just offering these ideas. We haven't implemented this yet, but this is, what we're, this is where our, our, our thinking has gotten to so far. Um, next. Uh, if the property was sold, uh, I've already stated that. The token holders would hold a copy of the agreement. So that's, yeah, so you might start coming across these deals in the future that, you know, you might start buying into properties, especially for millennials, people my age. We don't have the money to, to you know, fork out $600,000 and be in debt for the next 30 years. And we don't want to do it. We, we value our freedom differently. Um, so we'd be able to use this in a court law. Um, does that make sense, guys? Mm. All right, cool. How much time have we got? Really? Have I been talking for 45 minutes? Well, has it been useful so far? Practical? This is practical stuff. All right, well, basically, um, I started mentioning, I gave the example of a hospital. Businesses are going to start releasing. It's just, it's just going to matter a time before the brains, the, the noggin clicks in and realizes, oh, sh yeah, this is the way it's going. All businesses um, are, are going to be releasing token systems, just like all businesses have a website. It's just going to happen and, and there's going to be new capabilities possible from that. In fact, um, we're doing deals right now. We're actually doing, we're managing our property through tokens that we're managing on an Excel spreadsheet right now. And we are doing deals on our property where someone owns 50% of our tokens, but they don't want to own 50% of our property. And so we're doing a mortgage deal with them where we are taking back, uh, we're taking a loan. We're basically, we are remortgaging with a person. So once once you get um, into this mindset, you realize that um, anyone can be a bank, anyone can be a mortgager, like, you know, the mortgagee, the mortgager, sorry. And, um, and so we're, we're doing deals where people are um, putting those tokens in there, but they're actually, we're doing loan deals with them and then remortgaging and so that they can um, earn interest off the tokens that they've got in the property. So we've got people living on the property who are, who are owning 60% of the property. Um, but they don't have any voting rights or anything at the moment because they'd rather just earn interest off that. And so we just got a fee that we pay them a little interest each, each, um, each month. So there's also, I, I can't even explain it like until you've just gone through the process and realize what's going to happen because our brains just don't have the capacity to think past that. So, um, so, that's, so stage one is just let's just all get token savvy and let's just, you know, let's start tokenizing businesses. And once we get to that level one, then, you know, and everyone's playing around, then we can start playing around with, okay, now with these new, you know, liquid capacities, what, what's possible next? Um, and, and so that's why I'm really big on businesses tokenizing their services. So <coughs> the narrative is this service costs 100 XYZ tokens. Why would a business do this? Well, it's a test to see if the business is actually providing value. If that business is, and, and so, one of the things that people are getting really mixed up with right now is they're doing businesses and they always want to charge Australian dollars. Mm, no, nah, it's, not, it's not the way it's going to work. Um, they're, they're mixing up different token ecosystems. Um, you know, if a business or a charity or, or some type of entity is doing good, you know, they'll be rewarded because more people want to hold their tokens just to buy their service constantly. So the value pool will go up. That's why Ethereum works. That's why it's so stable. Um, and it's much high, high, higher value than a lot of other tokens because it actually is useful to execute smart contracts right now. Um, so it's a test. What the cool thing is, is it's a test to see if that business is actually providing value. Um, and so if it, I'd be very skeptical over the next couple of years if a business is selling blockchain services and they're not charging in, in tokens because basically as soon as you use fiat currency, it's a black door. Uh, it's it's going to get to a point where you'll be able to audit any business and you won't, you'll get to the point where you won't even want to buy something off a business unless their token ecosystem is transparent, unless their finances are transparent. You know, we're a bit sick of like going and buying stuff off businesses and not really show, sure what our energy is doing next or what that business is doing next. Like, you go and buy water, um, you know, but that, you know, people don't realise the impact of that water. It might be just be drying up lakes in India or whatever it might be. So you want to know, you want to see the financial transactions and verify that that company is doing what they're saying they're doing. Uh, people will buy tokens as a good service. Um, so that it, there'll be less need to sell anything. And I love selling. I ran, you know, owned a call center in Hong Kong and Bristol um, with 30 staff. I, love, I know what it's like to just jump on the phone and get and sell people. We don't have to sell things anymore, so there'll be less need to sell anything because people can go and self-verify if that business is what, you know, what, they're saying they're saying, what they're saying they're doing is actually happening. They can just look at the financial transactions. 
um, and allows, allows clients to hold their store of value in tokens. Another thing, just elaborating on that, is people who know that a business or that there's ethical people that are going to do the right thing uh, will buy those tokens and hold them at the start and they will be rewarded. So just like um, you know, you've got people, we've got a whole new class of, uh, I call them the techni techno elite. We've got a whole new class of computer scientists and engineers that are really rich now and they can start sort of like having a, a play in this uh, money system or having a say in how, they, how, how the world works. Um, good example, you know, Joseph Lubin, uh, my boss, he's a uh, computer scientist. Yeah, he didn't have a lot of money before. You know, now he's got a lot of money sitting there and he's actually just going and doing the right thing. Uh, pretty cool. And you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't get that from a venture capitalist. Or you know you wouldn't get that from traditional people in you know standard government positions issuing out uh, grants for different things. You know we've got now a, a pocket of people who see the world completely differently, and that's why it's changing so quickly. So we're going to just have this massive diversity of new ideas that's just going to cross pollinate across the whole planet yet again. So if the business is providing a good service, the value of tokens will go up, and the business will be supported to improve their offerings. So that's what's happening with Ethereum. So you know, now we're going to create a consensus, which is a, you know, trying to tackle these issues, hence the name, consensus. Um, and, and that's what's going on. So we all have that power now to release uh, energy pools. Uh, I've done it for a few of these people in the room here. Um, and, uh, and, everyone, and businesses can now be held accountable. All right, next. Oh, here we go. This is what I'm doing for the, um, the uh, telecommunications industry. So, you know, all right, 10 minutes, thanks. So one of the things, this is what a token ecosystem would look like. Um, now, one of the things that um, we're doing is we are going to lead by example. We're going to buy internet from global fire comp fi uh, fiber companies. So if you don't know how the internet works, 99% of your traffic runs through a, a glass cable that runs under the water everything you do. In fact, things you do in Brisbane here, just talking to a friend, goes and runs through a cable underwater, goes to an American server, probably goes to a European server, and then comes back here. Um, so that, that's, you know, maybe not a European server, but, you know, American server for sure. Now, we're just going to buy bulk internet, and then we're going to release a token, uh, an access token to, to, to access that internet, and then we're going to teach um, lots of... Um, uh, lots of regional ISPs how they can buy that token um, and start buying the internet from us with no lock-in contract. So one of the things with ISPs at the moment is that they uh, they cut they're, they're, they're all you're going to see all these you're seeing a wave of small ISPs, but where they get crunched is they don't have enough finances to to if they're buying 10 gigabits worth of data per month, whatever it might be. Um, if they want to go up to 20 gigabits, they probably only need another one gigabit to manage the next 300 customers, but they can't just make that step, so they're kind of, you know, this is kind of like this corporate bullying, basically. They can't sort of like survive, um, but this token ecosystem will allow people to have no lock-in contracts and just buy the tokens and what they need. It, it, it empowers us because everyone needs to pay for internet every day, so we'll be able to scale up what we're doing and provide a better service because the tokens will be not very valuable at the start, um, and. Um, and then you know buy the equipment and hardware that whatever we need. But what was cool, what's cool is that we're going to be teaching the ISPs that buy internet from us to do the same thing and release a token energy system as well. So it might be that we might be all be trading our most precious resource, which is the internet, um, uh, on the lower level. So in Sydney, I took that. I should have done Brisbane, but I took Sydney because I found a good graphic. But um, basically, we might all be trading internet tokens when we buy a coffee just because it's something that we all have in common, that we all use as resource internet. And all the way down the line, and I'm choosing internet first because internet companies have such an intimate relationship with every other company, uh, that, with, with all their customers, all the other businesses. So then I'm teaching the internet companies to go and uh, then uh, release token, e uh, token ecosystems to all the small businesses as well. So we're just going to be living in this world of abundance where everyone's going to have 20 billion tokens in their wallet. They can pay for a coffee in any different way. The cool thing is that everything's very transparent. So the good businesses will, su will really thrive and, and uh, survive. The bad ones will just be squashed out. All right, what else? So it's cool, because then you'll be able to appreciate the costs of what it takes to build internet infrastructure. Everyone can self-audit. Um, it's it's going to be very easy. So for instance, we want to give internet to Dir uh, Bandy, you know, out in the uh, middle of Queensland. Um, you know, 
we need to, in order to do that, we need to put a $120,000 router just here in Charlotte, Charlotte Street to make that possible. Uh, so we can put up a crowd, file and, crowd sale and everyone can buy you know, up to a, raise $120,000, um, put the router in, rent some fibers on a fiber loop and provide internet. That's something that Telstra or larger corporations won't even worry about because all they worry about is, is the people in, in the actual, in the major cities right now. Um, and you know, we're just constantly ignoring you know, the people that actually support this country. Um, uh, that was just a, an example of what would happen in a management of a token ecosystem. Um, you know, we might have DCOM that manages 21% of the tokens, um, which might be, you know, worth 34 minutes. This is just a scenario that might happen. Not sure what's going to happen. But what I do know is that people do need to pay their internet bill every day. It's something that's quite um, uh, important. It's not, you know, they don't need to style their hair every day, but they do need to pay their internet bill every day. So there will be some baseline sort of value to these tokens. Um, that's, ev that's everything. Thank you, everyone. Oh.